I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, if only that were true. Great song, can't feel at home. How many of you feel at home in this world? Oh, you're lying like a rug. I do. Sometimes I feel very at home in this world, don't you? Because I fit in. As long as I fit in, I feel pretty much like everybody else does. And I fit in, and we're good, and I feel at home. But it's like, sometimes it's like when I start not fitting in that I'm, I don't feel at home. And that is the goal, is to be uncomfortable. I said, I did a sermon a little while ago. I said, listen, I don't want you to walk out of here just uncomfortable. I want you to walk out of here disgusted so that you change. You know what I mean? It's like if we're, if we're not disgusted, if, we, if we're still just comfortable, don't want to make you feel comfortable. Don't come to church to feel comfortable. Well, not this church. I'm sure there's some you can go to where you're going to walk out of there going, yep, I'm fine. But you're not fine. If you were fine, you wouldn't have to come to church. <laughs> right? If you don't need Jesus... If you got it all figured out, what is the point? In Daniel, what we've been looking at for the last seven, eight weeks, wow, it's really has been, it's been an awesome. Hasn't it been awesome? It's been very cool. We've been watching um, great Bible stories. Daniel and the lions. Not just one, the lions. And he's like, yeah. Daniel and the lion. It's like, no, dude, there were more than one. <laughs> Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, otherwise known as, I don't remember their Hebrew names, I'm, I'm very bad. Anyway, what, what happened to them? Fire. Fi fires, more than one too. Just fiery, fir <laughs> fiery furnace. So we all, Bible stories, woo, you know, the kids know these Bible stories, but they're not really just really cool Bible stories. They really aren't about the lions or the fire. They're really about the God of Daniel and the God of his friends and the faithfulness of those men to serve God in some wacky situations, right? I mean, you don't get threatened with death every day for praying, right? You don't get threatened for not conforming to the point that they're going to die if you don't. You know, bow down. No, man. O king, live forever. But I'm not bowing. And that's the goal that we have been trying to teach. It's not just Bible stories, but we're exiles, as Bradley shared this morning. We're, we're not supposed to feel at home. We're supposed to recognize that we're in a foreign land. We, this, our true home is a heavenly kingdom. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom exiling here in a fallen world. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Okay. So the thing that we're trying to, to work on by looking at these different records is to see how God worked in men to stay faithful even though it would have been easier to conform. Isn't it? Sometimes easier to conform. Now, these guys had some crazy cool things happen, but they didn't wake up one day and go, hey, I'm going to be a faithful servant of the Most High God. You don't just wake up one day and be able to trust God like they did. Being brave and being faithful in the big things comes from being faithful where? in the little things. So we have a verse in Luke. Read this one. This is so cool. Jesus says, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in what? Much. In much. And he who is unrighteous, meaning we're not faithful, we bow down. We go, oh yeah, okay, I'll do whatever you want. Oh, I will fit in. Oh, I will conform. He who is unfaithful to God in the little things, guess what? He's going to be unfaithful, unrighteous, also in what? Much. In much. Interesting, isn't it? Folks, do me a favor. Today, take this one home in your heart, okay? It's not for the person sitting next to you. It's for you. It's not for the person who didn't come today. It's for you. It's for me. I think that folks forget about being faithful in little things. I think that we think, I don't know why we do this, but I think sometimes we think that this faithful God who values that incredibly 
is going to bless us with amazing responsibilities and great opportunities and blessings, even though we are not faithful people. Does that make any sense? Why would he do that? If we aren't faithful, why would a faithful God bless you with great blessings, opportunities, if, if you're like, eh, you know, if you're not sticking with him on the little, why is he going to go boom, awesome blessing on you? Doesn't make sense. Does that happen at work? You don't show up for work. <laughs> boom, raise. <laughs> Well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> oh man, he didn't come in again today. Pfft, send him money. <laughs> maybe he won't come in tomorrow either. You know, we, we kind of get, we get almost offended if we're passed over for promotions or if that business opportunity doesn't come through or that relationship doesn't pan out or that church doesn't give you an opportunity to serve in some high position. But we ourselves are not consistent in our contribution, our attendance, our attitude, or our performance. We have to be consistent in those things, in the little things, before we can expect the big ones. Does that make any sense? Okay, so we need to be faithful and trustworthy in doing what we should all the time. All the time. Not just when we feel like it. Not just when it is convenient. I have no doubt after studying these Daniel records that Daniel was like that, that he was faithful and that he was consistent, amen? I mean, remember, remember the dude Darius in, in um, Daniel 6, the king? He, he, he's not really happy about Daniel having to go into the lion's den, but he had a, done that stupid decree thing. Got sucked into that one, right? Daniel's getting tossed in the lion's den and here's what... Here's what the king says. May the God whom you serve continually. Do I have that one up? No, I don't. May the God whom you serve continually deliver you. Again, the dude was faithful in little and faithful consistently. So that when, boom, there's that big situation in his life, he doesn't crumble. He's still faithful to God. And God responds to that kind of faithfulness with deliverance, with deliverance. God didn't do that, by the way, just so we'd have cool Bible stories. You know, it's like, hey, this is cool. We'll throw this one in here. But God used those situations, the fiery furnace, the lion's den, all these different weird, tough, tough situations. He used these situations to bring great glory to himself. And tons of folks were impacted we forget that sometimes. Remember those royal decrees that went out after God delivers them? The kings write these decrees that say, God of Daniel, that's the one. That's the one. That's who you all, you can't say nothing bad about him. And you're going to worship this God. Now, do you think a few people listened to that and took notice and changed maybe from worshiping the Babylonian gods of this age of their world, do you think maybe they switched over to Yahweh? Traded up? Do you think that might have happened? Yeah. 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 Because faithful men chose to serve a faithful God. That's how that happens. It doesn't happen like once. It happens because they were consistent in their worship and their service of the Lord. Okay. Do you want to be that way? Oh, thanks, son. So nice. Faithful. Sorry. Enter into the joy of thy mother. <laughs> I have no doubt um, that we want to be faithful like Daniel. We want to, I mean, you know, if they were writing a story, if you got print, you know, in the Bible, what would it be about? Well, hopefully. Oh, well, yeah, you know, like uh, they came to church once and then that was kind of grabbed out and then we never heard from them again. I mean, that would not be a good Bible story with your name on it, right? So, I mean, it's reputation. What's your reputation? Reputations are made not in a day and not in one big event, folks. Reputations are made through consistency, daily consistency. That is what makes a Christian different is consistent 
faithful obedience to God, even when we don't feel like it or it's inconvenient, okay? Doing what is right, not just when it benefits us, but doing what is right, even when it's difficult. Why do we do that? Because we love God more than we love ourselves. And that, folks, is a hard lesson to learn. So, here we go. Let me set it up. Here we are. So, do we agree so far with everything I've said? Anybody take issue with this yet? No? Okay, good. Because when we read in the Bible, here's the setup. Leave now. Okay, no. Okay. When we read in the Bible that the Lord wants us to act a certain way, or speak a certain way, or to live a certain way, does he want us to do it once? Does he want us to do it more than once? Does he want and expect us to do it all the time? <sighs> Consistently would be the word, yes? He wants us to be consistent in doing what he says to do or not doing what he says not to do, right? Wouldn't that work too? Okay, so that's the setup. And by the way, what a witness. What a witness. You know, witnessing is not quoting a Bible verse, people. That isn't what changes people's lives necessarily. That's not what gets their attention. It's being the Bible verse. You, not quoting it, but being it. Tell your neighbor, be the verse. Be the verse. Be the Bible verse you want to see. I like that. We should get bumper stickers. Be the Bible verse you want to see. You know what I'm saying? Not just once, consistently. Not just one, but you know what's the worst? That's how people know that you're a Christian, is not by your bumper sticker, not by your once, you know, you, you quoted a Bible verse once, it's how you live. The greatest witness is how you live, how you choose to live by being the Bible verse. I think the worst thing that can happen is when you as a Christian, right, you know, you know you're a Christian, right? Right? That's not a surprise to anybody here. What? You didn't tell me that. You know what stinks? Is if people that you've known a long time find out and go, what? They go, hold on. I didn't know you were a Christian. Ow. Right? Wow, I wouldn't have thought you were a Christian. Whoops. Seriously, that's a bad thing. Obviously, you are not being the Bible verse. You know, you're being, this world is sure my home. And living though, I'm not just passing through. My treasures are right here. You all can have the blue. Right? So that we start, we can start conforming. Like this is really where we, oh yeah, this is where I live. Yeah, this is what my life is supposed to be all about. That's right. I'm supposed to conform. So, people should know that we are Christians by our behavior, our speech, our lifestyle, our refusal to conform to this world. So the verse for today, ready? This is the one that God wants us to obey, not just once. You're going to hate me. You're, gonna, you're just not going to like this. We will not be friends. Ready? Boom. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Shall I just leave that up there for a while? Yeah. We'll just like wrap our brains around that for a while. Okay, good. Tell me when you're done. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a Bible verse. Be the verse you want to see. Oh my gosh. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. You notice nobody came today? No. <laughs> I swear the devil knew. What a verse. Just once? All the time? 
Okay, why is this important? Don't answer that. I'm going to do it for you because that's my job. Why is this important? Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Go to your neighbor and go, shut up. <laughs> no, you shut up. No, you shut up. Okay, all right. Why is this important? Why is this grumbling and complaining? Some of you enjoyed that way too much. I'm looking back and people are like, that's right. This is, why would God spend an entire Bible verse? This is just a short verse. I like these short ones. Can everybody remember this? Do all things without grumbling or complaining. Can you say it? Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Here's why. Ready? Boom. So that, reason is, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Hold on. How do we prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent? By not grumbling or complaining. Chil Wait, we prove ourselves to be what? Children of God above reproach? By not or in where? In the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, in the midst of our exile, Okay? We get to prove ourselves to be children of God. We get to prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent in the midst of our little exile here among whom you appear as lights. What? Okay, that's a lot of words, but I'm trying to break it down. You understand? How do you appear as a light? By not or... Isn't that crazy? Dudes, of all the things that God could highlight of all the attributes and characteristics to say, this is how you prove yourself to be my children. He picks grumbling and complaining. What, what wait, wait, what about lion taming? Huh? Huh? That would prove it. How about fire walking? Huh? Comes in handy. But guys, that's not kind of the real world that we live in, right? I don't do a lot of lion taming, not a lot of fire walking, right? But this verse, do all things without grumbling and complaining. That's something every single one of us can wrap our lives around. Not the fire walking and the lion taming necessarily, right? Unless you work at a zoo. But this is something, this is, so you ask yourself, why does God use no grumbling, no complaining as the boom, standard for proving ourselves blameless, innocent, proving ourselves to be children of God, proving ourselves to be above reproach in the middle of our exile, among whom we are now what? Lights, lights, lights in the world. Okay, a light is a light only if it's surrounded by darkness. Get it? Anybody notice any darkness around them in the world? Yeah, okay. So, one of the key things that God, the, in this passage, the key thing to being a light is not grumbling and not complaining. I, I love the, this teaching and I hate this teaching. I love this teaching because it's simple and anybody can do it. I hate this teaching because it's simple and anybody can do it. Which means I can, I can, I know, uh, I can do this. This is something that God wants me to do. It's not this, is this, is this beyond everybody here? Is there anybody here who's like, listen, this is above my, you know, intellect quotient. This is beyond my ability quotient. Well, actually it is. I'm going to show you why it's going to take more than just a resolution. It's going to take more than just behavior modification to fulfill this verse. Do all things, you wouldn't think that would be such a hard thing. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Okay, question. Do you want to, do you want to like be a shiny person in, in, in the world? Yes, okay. Will you look different if you are? Yeah, because the world around you is kind of shadowy and dark, right? People, remember Victor Sharon, we have insight. They don't have insight. 
because all they know is what they're in. This world is their home, okay? They don't know that they're just passing through. Give me Jesus is not a song they're singing every morning, right? When I'm open, my eyes, you know, no, no, no. You know, darkness. We have insight into what's happening. So but let me ask you, if you as a Christian, if you and I grumble and complain just like everybody else, we're just as dark and shadowy as them, amen? No, seriously. We're just as dark and shadowy as people who have no light, people who have no insight uh, into what is really going on in the world, that it's a spiritual battle, that we are going to live forever with Christ. I mean, they don't know this stuff. They have no choice but to grumble and complain because without, who prayed it? I don't know who prayed it. Somebody prayed it this morning. What do you do without God? I have a hard enough time as a Christian getting through the weird stuff with God. Seriously, it don't always go well. How do you do it without God? Okay, oh my goodness. So look, the Christian, the, re the reason why the people that are dark, that make you wanna grumble and complain, they don't have a choice. Do we agree with that? Next time they grumble and complain, next time they're nasty, do yourself and them a favor and recognize, oh man, they have no other choice. You get it? Seriously. It's like when a two-year-old, you know, drops the bowl of mac and cheese on the floor, you don't get all upset, you know, because they're two. You kind of expect that. All right, so you deal with them differently and you clean, oh, here, buddy, I'm sorry, and you clean it up for them, you know what I mean? And, and you give it back to them. Two second rule. <laughs> Get it? Now, if he started pulling at, you know, with the mac and cheese on the floor, either of these two, right? I would be dealing with that a little different, right? Four second rule. But. So when, when people in the world who have no insight, who have no light, when they start dumping their mac and cheese all over you, they have no choice. So get over it a little bit quicker, you know, and go, oh, right, I'm the one who's the light. They're not. I'm the one who's the light in this situation. No grumbling, no complaining. Oh, I'm sorry. I know this is hurting and you're all like, hate this, hate this, hate this. Grumbling, 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 grumbling. So you know better because you know the future. And you can rise above and choose to obey God and not just your feelings. Folks, grumbling and complaining is a result of our feelings. It's our response to our feelings, how we feel about something. I don't like what you just said to me. I don't like what just happened. I don't like how things are going, so I grumble about it, and I complain about it because that's how I feel, all right? Folks, through the spirit of God Almighty, we've been delivered from being, having to obey our feelings. Does that make sense? Do, we, do you agree with that? Is Jesus your master or not? Or are you still it? If you're still your own master, you will do what your feelings tell you because your feelings will rule your world. Do we agree with that? So we as a Christian are supposed to be delivered from that and obey this higher calling and not our mere human feelings. Look, Daniel lived above the world even though he was in exile. He, he lived above it. What happens when you and I choose to live like everybody else. Are we, are, we, are we lights at that point? Are we saying, hey, look at me, man. I represent Jesus. No. Are we drawing people to our Lord when we're just like everybody else? No, we're not. Because we look just like them. And this is a huge subject for God. Now, <laughs> grumbling and complaining, those two words that we just read in Philippians 2, 14. They've been used before in the Bible. The same two words are used consistently someplace else, and it's called the book of Numbers. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Numbers. It's easy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, fourth book. So God says, you want to be a light? 
You want to look different? You, you want to illuminate? You want to you show people what's really going on? Stop grumbling. Stop complaining. Can it really be this easy? I mean, isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah, maybe in your heart of hearts, you're like, oh God, all I want to do is be a light for you. And you're trying to, you know, climb mountains and tame lions and do all this really, you know, hard, difficult, crazy, cool stuff. And all along, it, it's as simple as just not grumbling and complaining. People will take more notice of you because you don't complain. That's insane. Simple. Easy. Anybody can do this. So this has come up before, this issue of grumbling and complaining. Do you remember the um, children of Israel? They were in captivity for 430 years in what country? Egypt, right for $200, Egypt for $200. Okay, so you've got the children of Israel are in captivity. God, they cry to the Lord, they say, we want out, we want out. So who does he send? Moses, Moses loud and proud. Say it. Moses comes to deliver them and the goal that God has is to take them straight from Egypt and march them right into the promised land. Okay. It's not a long trip. Seriously, it's not a long trip. What would it take? Does anybody know the Dan Kutcher? You probably, isn't it? Yeah, it was like a couple of weeks, right? It should have taken a couple of weeks. Um, how long did it end up taking? Well, you know, if they had asked a woman for some directions. <laughs> no, I'm not asking directions. I'm not going to ask anybody. Okay, man, 40 years, baby. It took you. A couple of weeks. Ended up taking a long time. Why could they not march in? I'm gonna take, give me numbers. First one there. Hold on, wait, don't do it yet because I need a drum roll. Wait, wait. They didn't go right in like God wanted. Something horrific kept happening. Kept happening over and over and over again so that they could not go in. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, how long shall I bear with this evil generation who are against me. I have heard the Complaints. of the sons of Israel which they are making against me. You know why they didn't get to go in? Grumbling and complaining. What? Aren't you like, stop it. I'm sure it was something much worse than that. No, it's that. Grumbling and complaining. By the time we get here in, in, in Numbers 14, this was a pattern for them. This wasn't like, like I said, you don't wake up one day and be great. You don't wake up one day and be nasty either. You've been nasty a long time. <laughs> Seriously. These guys had been complaining and grumbling. I mean, they've been in slavery. I'm sure they had a little bit of complaining while they were, you know what I mean? It just becomes their MO. They complain. They don't like nothing. So they like a lot of grumbling, a lot of complaining. So, but God just did some stupid cool stuff. Ten plagues, remember those? Impressive, right? Brings them out, they're, but they don't, but, but they, they're still complaining. This is just, okay, it's crazy. Um, they're still all, these, these guys, they've been responding to their circumstances for so long, they complain all the time. Okay, here, here we go. Here's, here's some of the complaints, ready? This is while they're still in Egypt. And, and Moses and the plagues and, you know, all these things are going on before they get... Oh, you know, Moses, this whole talk of this Yahweh and this promised land talk, it's just making our lives really more difficult. Yes, right? Remember that? They're like, you're, the, Pharaoh's being meaner to us because you're, you know, and they had to start making bricks without straw. And all this. So they start complaining. Life got, life got harder to the point... Here's one of their other grumbles and complaints. Moses, just leave us alone. Just stop it. We're not interested in this stuff. We don't want to, we, because it's me, it's, it's, it was easier just to be miserable than to be miserable with a hope, yes. When once out of Egypt, here's one of them. Oh, you gotta do it like that. Oh, we don't like the water out here. It's different. How about this one? We're hungry. We should have stayed in Egypt. We had garlic and squash. 
That wouldn't have been my thing. It would be like, we had pastries and coffee. You know, but they're like, we had garlic and squash in Egypt. You should have left us alone there. Oh, we're thirsty again. Oh, we want to, uh, wait, we want a God we can see. Yeah, let's build a cafe thing, right? So let's complain about the God that we have and we're going to build a cafe thing because that would be really cool. And it can take us back to Egypt. Really? Hello? How about this one? We want some meat, not this dumb old manna stuff. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, yeah. Oh, wait, here's another one. We don't like the leadership. <laughs> Who made you? Who made you the boss over us, Moses? You know what? We're going to appoint our own leader and we're going back. That's right. We're going back to slavery in Egypt and you can't stop us. Well, that's brilliant. Brilliant. So there's complaining and there's grumbling. They've been doing, and that's exact. Here's the thing. To the point where they get to the prom, ready to cross into the promised land, and they just flat out say, No, God, we're not going to go. The giants are too big. We don't trust you. You can't handle it. I'm going back to Egypt. Get it? Dudes, if grumbling and complaining is your MO, that's what you do all the time. Even when faced with greatness and the blessings of God, we can just say, Nope. Not going to do it. Don't trust you. I'm going back to Egypt. Does that, is that a temptation for any of us? Yeah. Yeah. Give me Numbers 14, 3, please. Here's, here's exactly what they say. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's get a new leader and return to Egypt. And then they actually grabbed stones to, to throw at Moses and kill him. It's amazing what we'll do when we're unhappy. So, crazy. Let's go back. Whole lot of grumbling going on about a God who has been nothing but provisional, loving, delivering, right? Has God ever done anything for the Israelites at this point? Has God ever done anything for you? Okay. Has he ever provided for you? Has he ever been delivered you, loved you, cared for you? So... You ever doubted, ever complained, ever grumbled? And this is exactly what our grumbling sounds like. Bradley and I had to talk about this. Was a good, this was a good one. Just like them, we're like, you know, this Christian thing is just too hard. It just makes my life miserable. It just, I really wish I wasn't a Christian because then I could just do what I wanted. Boy, you know what? God, just leave me alone because you're making me really uncomfortable. You're asking stuff of me that I, I'm just not, I, I don't want to do. I, I, I liked my food and my drink in Egypt. There was garlic squash, pastries, Dunkin' Donuts, right? I, I'm hungry, but the things of this world, man, they're not filling me like they used to. I want to be filled like I used to be, because I'm not willing to let you fill me. No, God. I am not. I don't trust you. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The complaints are the same. We do get to the place where we say, God, no, I got this. I'm going to handle my marriage. I'm going to handle my finances. I'm going to do what I know to get me back to where I'm comfortable. And that's Egypt, folks, and that's slavery, back to our feelings, back to our mere human emotions where that's what's going to run us. And you know what? Then we're just going to keep responding to the life that we're living and becoming complainers and grumblers, always responding to how miserable our life is. So what stops the pattern? How do we stop this? Not by, if I said, amen, everybody would walk out and go, man, that was great. That was really great. You know, I, I do complain sometimes. I do grumble sometimes, and I, I really got to stop that. What stopped it for the Israelites? Did it stop? Yeah, it actually kind of did. Because, okay, here's what happened. It's crazy. The last time the people of Israel really got together and complained is very significant, and it parallels our lives as Christians 
if we want to live God-glorifying lives. The major complaint, we're going to get into Numbers 24. The major complaint comes in Numbers, uh, Numbers 21. Yet again, they are complaining and they're grumbling against God. And God says, fine, fine, fine. Here's a taste of your own venomous poison that's been coming out of your mouths, complaining all the time. Here's a little taste of that. And he actually sends venomous serpents to bite them. Numbers 21, verse 4. Here we go. Check it out now. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. Christians, anybody feel that way? You're impatient. You're in your wilderness. You're dealing with stuff. This is not going the way you want. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You're hot. You're this. You don't like what's happening. Blah, 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 blah. And you get impatient in your journey. Well, now you got to choose, man. What are you going to say about that? How are you going to work your brain about that? Well, here's what they did. So the people spoke against God and Moses. Bad answer. Bad answer. But that's how they responded. And they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Hold on a second. Is there food? What's it called? manna, God's provision. We hate it. We hate this miserable food. We don't like God. We don't like what you are, God. We don't like what you're doing in our lives. What's happening in my life right now, I don't like it. It's, miser it, it's miserable. I want something else. And we get impatient in our journeys, in our walks with God, and we start wanting to quit. We loathe what God is doing in our lives. We want to go back to being normal. We want to be back to not having to be a Christian. So God, verse 6, Lord sends fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people. And lots of people of Israel did what? It's crazy. Isn't that an interesting story? So he's like, really? I'm done with you guys. You want venom? Venom's coming out of your mouth. Venom is what's in your hearts. This is what you're speaking, complaining, grumbling all the time. Fine, I'm going to give you something to grumble about. I'm going to give you something to cry about. Right? You ever hear that one? Right? And that's exactly what happens. Okay, and thanks for coming. God bless. <laughs> Have a great day out there. Watch out for those little crawly things. Because you just never know. Next time you grumble and complain, better check around your feet. No, that's not, how, that's not the end of this story. They're dying, folks. This is serious. They're not just having a bad day. These people have been bit by venomous serpents. They are dying. And as they're dying, they finally realize their propensity for sin that this constant grumbling, this constant complaining, this dissatisfaction with God and his provision, that finally call, causes them to cry out to the Lord and say, heal us. Please heal us. So the people in verse 7, the people come to Moses and they say, we have sinned. We have sinned. Folks, look at me. If you haven't said that, you don't get healed. If you still think you're okay, if you don't think, if you think you got it together, if you don't realize that you have sinned, the rest of this verse will not happen for you. They said, we have sinned by speaking against you and Moses intercede with the Lord Moses please that he may remove the serpents from us and Moses intercedes and prays and begs God to heal them and God does it in a very weird way next verse the Lord says to Moses make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard on a pole right lift that up and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten when he looks at what? The serpent, what's going to happen to him? I got a photo. 
Is there a photo next? Oh, no, no, you're right. Next verse. So that's what Moses did. He made a bronze serpent, set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man when he looked to the bronze serpent, what would happen? He lived. Look at the, uh, the picture. You got a picture there, Tom? Look at that. Very interesting. So when they're bitten and they realize, now when you're bitten, when you're sick and you're dying, you can either just look at yourself and say, I'm dying, I'm dying. My life is miserable. Uh. Guess what would happen to them if they had done that? They would have died. But instead, he says, you take your eyes off of yourself. You take your eyes off of your miserable circumstances. Take your eyes off of the exile that you are in. Take your eyes off of all the things that make you complain and all the things that you want to grumble about. Take your eyes off of that and put it on something else. Something specifically. Something God has provided. Not something else that I can show you. Oh, Jeannie, don't be miserable. Look, here's a frog. I got you, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Or like, oh, Lee, you know, don't, don't complain. And really, look, you know, you can come, you can come to church. Oh, that sounds better, doesn't it? But God is providing something specific besides a frog for Jeannie and church for Lee. Church is good. Frogs are kind of cool too. But I could say, oh, look, you're miserable. Here's a cocktail. Oh, you're grumbling and want to complain? Here, let's listen to this music, right? Give me something else. What else can fix your grumbling and your complaining? Food. Food. Oh, yes. Stress eating. Anybody? Stress eating. You're miserable and you complain, so give me a hot dog. That's right. So in other words, there's all kinds of things that we can look at to make us feel better. But listen, folks, after they realized they were sinning against God and had been poisoned, God heals them by having them fix their gaze on a bronze serpent. And I got to tell you, after this in incident here in Numbers, there's no more complaining. They, they mess up a little bit, but nothing like what had happened before because they look on this serpent and they are healed. How does this relate to us, Pam? In other words, we only, we, we only get saved from this poisonous, complaining nature when we look at it face to face and go, oh, I've been bitten. We face it up and then we remove our focus off of our pain and our issues and the misery that we're in and we put it, fix our gaze on the cure. I have had, I've been in cancer tests. I've had cancer tests for 21 years. I've had MRIs, CTs, x-rays. I have had every, hey, I had a thoracic CT this week. Chest, abdomen, you know, pelvic, all of this stuff. Thursday, why? You know why? To see if there's any disease left in me. So that if there is, I can find out and get the right treatment. Amen? That's what I'm talking about, folks. We have to look at our spiritual MRIs and go, whoa. Let's acknowledge our sinful natures and our need for a cure. Not just the day you first believed. I'm talking yesterday. I'm talking today. I'm talking tomorrow. You have to be convicted in your hearts that you need the cure or you're never going to get it. You're not going to fight for it. We need to look in the mirror and finally acknowledge how susceptible we are to the stuff like complaining and grumbling. We have to say, yes, Lord, I know I've been poisoned. Yeah. I've been poisoned and I am living with venom in my heart and venom in my mouth. It's coming out to my family, to my spouse, to my kid. It's coming out at work. It's coming out wherever I go. It's all right here. Are you kidding? I poison myself daily with my words that I choose to think up here. Can I get an amen on that? Where we just, it's like, I'm just going to complain and I'm going to grumble. Oh, but I don't say it out loud. I just think it behind your back. No. It's, this is where I need to be healed and say, Lord, 
I need the cure. I need the cure. And when we say that, we agree that Jesus is the cure. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Isn't that amazing? If you've never read this verse, just as Moses lifted up the serpent and when people looked at him, that serpent were healed, folks, we only get delivered when we take our eyes off of this exile and turn our eyes upon Jesus. It's not behavior modification. Amen. Amen. Jesus was lifted up on the cross that same way that Moses put that serpent on the pole and our only hope for deliverance and healing is in him. It's not just behavior modification. It's not just, you know, saying, oh, well, I shouldn't do this. But here it is. What is going to change your lives is if you come face to face with your sorry state and recognize your constant need for a Savior. That God has provided all that we need. And it's in Jesus Christ today, tomorrow, and every day. Get your focus off of yourself. Look unto Jesus and even in your exile, folks, there is nothing so wrong with your world that God can't make it right through Christ. Remember, you got that insight. You know what's going to happen. You know your future. You know, folks, you may, it, you know, the car may still break, but that's all right. You, God will make sure you get a ride, okay? The refrigerator may not work, but God will make sure you get fed, you may not have all the money you want, but God will make sure that you're rank. What? Okay, you might be sick. And you know what? You may die, but God is going to get you up. God is going to get you up. And when you got that kind of insight, you keep your eyes upon Jesus. Things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You keep your eyes on Christ, you will not have so much to complain about. You will not be grumbling when your eyes are on the prize. We're so grateful, God. We pray. We're praying now just to help us to be grateful. That our future is so bright. This is not our final home, Lord. We're just passing through. And I praise you, God. I praise you, God. I praise you, God, for that. Lord, we want to look so different so different that people take notice. Lord, we want, we want to be a light to a world. Please, God, help us to take our eyes and put it on Jesus so that we aren't the complainers and we're not the grumblers the rest of the world is. We need your help with this. We need a work of the Spirit. We need a confession of faith. That's what salvation is all about, is saying, Jesus, I confess my need for you and I'm, I'm confessing, Lord, my need right now. I confess my need for you. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless this congregation, bless these people, bless whoever hears this with a renewed recognition and acknowledgement of their need for you. And that through Jesus, you have provided us all good things in every way out. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.